Chapter 2. Kirk's Dragoons Oglethorpe Farm stood a mile or so south of the Bridgewater on the right bank of the river. It was a straggling Tudor building showing grey above the ivy that clothed its lower parts. Approaching it now through the fragrant orchard amid what see, what it amid which it seemed to drowse in Arcadian peace beside the water of the parrot, sparkling in the moon, morning sun, Mr. Blood might have had a difficulty in believing it part of a world tormented by strife and bloodshed. On the bridge, as they had been riding out of Bridgewater, they had met a vanguard of fugitives from the field of battle, weary, broken men, many of them wounded, all of them terror-stricken, staggering in speedless haste with the last remnants of their strength, into the shelter which it was their vain illusion the town would afford them. Eyes glazed with lassitude and fear looked up piteously out of haggard faces at Mr. Blood and his companion as they rode forth. Hoarse voices cried a warning that merciless pursuit was not far behind. Undeterred, however, young Pitt rode a main the dusty road by which these poor fugitives from that swift rout on Sedgemoor came flocking in ever-increasing numbers. Presently he swung aside and, quitting the road, took to a pathway that crossed the dewy meadowlands. Even here they met odd groups of human derelicts who were scattering in all directions, looking fearfully behind them as they came through the long grass, expecting at every moment to see the red coats of the dragoons. But as, but as Pitt's direction was a southward one, bringing them ever nearer to Feversham's headquarters, they were presently clear of that human flotsam and jetsam of the battle, and riding through the peaceful orchards heavy with the ripening fruit that was soon to make its annual yield of cider. At last they alighted on the kidney stones of the courtyard, and Baines, the master of the homestead, grave of countenance and flustered of manner, gave them welcome. In the spacious stone-flagged hall, the doctor found Lord Gil Gildoy, a very tall and dark young gentleman, prominent of chin and nose, stretched on a cane day-bed under one of the tall mullioned windows in the care of Mrs. Baines and her comely daughter. His cheeks were leaden-hued, his eyes closed, and from his blue lips came with each labored breath a faint, moaning noise. Mr. Blood stood for a moment, silently considering his patient. He deplored that a youth with such bright hopes in life as Lord Gildoy should have risked all, perhaps existence itself, to forward the ambition of a worthless, worthless adventurer. Because he had liked and honored this brave lad, he paid his case the tribute of a sigh. Then he knelt to his task, ripped away the doublet and underwear to lay bare his lordship's mangled side, and called for water and linen, and what else he needed for his work. He was still intent upon it a half hour later, when the dragoons invaded the homestead. The clatter of hooves and hoarse shouts that heralded their approach disturbed him not at all, for one thing, he was not easily disturbed. For another, his task absorbed him. But his lordship, who had now recovered consciousness, showed considerable alarm, and the battle-stained Jeremy Pitt sped to cover in a cloth press. Baines was uneasy, and his wife and daughter trembled. Mr. Blood re reassured them. Why, what's to fear, he said. It's a Christian country, this, and Christian men do not make war upon the wounded, nor upon those who harbor them. He had, he still had, you see, illusions about Christians. He held a glass of cordial, prepared under his directions to his lordship's lips. Give your mind peace, my lord. The worst is done. And then they came, rattling and clanking, into the stone-flagged hall, a round dozen jack-booted, lobster-coated troopers of the Tangiers Regiment, led by a sturdy, black-browed fellow with a deal of gold lace about the breast of his coat. Bain stood his ground, his attitude half defiant, whilst his daughter, his wife and daughter shrank away in renewed fear. Mr. Blood, at the head of the daybed, looked over his shoulder to take stock of the invaders. The officer barked an order, which brought his men to an attentive halt, then swaggered forward, his gloved hand bearing down the pummel of his sword, his spurs jingling musically as he moved. He announced his authority to the yeoman. I am Captain Hobart of Colonel Kirk's dragoons, what rebels do you harbor? The yeoman took alarm at the ferocious 
truculence. It expressed itself in his trembling voice. I, I, I no harbor no re rebels, sir. This wounded gentleman. I can see for myself. The captain stamped forward to the daybed and scowled down upon the gray-faced sufferer. No need to ask how he came in this state and by his wounds. A damned rebel. That's enough for me. He flung a command at his dragoons. Out with him, my lads. Mr. Blood got between the daybed and the troopers. In the name of humanity, sir, said he on, the note of ang on a note of anger. This is England, not Tangiers. The gentleman is in a sore case. He may not be moved without peril to his life. Captain Hobart was amused. Oh, I am to be tender of the lives of these rebels. Odds blood. Do you think it's to benefit his health we're taking him? There's gallows being planted along the road from Weston to Bridgewater, and he'll serve for one of them as well as another. Colonel Kirkle learned these non-conforming oaths something they'll not forget in generations. You're hanging men without trial? Faith, then. It's mistaken I am. We're in Tangiers, after all, it seems, where your regiment belongs. The captain considered him with a kindling eye. He looked him over from the soles of his riding boots to the crown of his periwig. He noted the spare, active frame, the arrogant poise of the head, the air of authority that invested Mr. Blood and soldier recognized soldier. The captain's eyes narrowed. Recognition went further. Who the hell may you be? He exploded. My name is Blood, sir. Peter Blood, at your service. Aye, aye, Codso, that's the name. You were in the French service once, were you not? If Mr. Blood was surprised, he did not betray it. I was? Then I remember you, five years ago or more. You were in Tangiers. That is so. I knew your colonel. Faith, you may be renewing the acquaintance. The captain laughed unpleasantly. What brings you here, sir? This wounded gentleman. I was fetched to attend him. I am a medicus. A doctor? You? Scorn of that lie, as he conceived it, rang in the heavy, hectoring voice. Medicani Beccalarius, said Mr. Blood. Don't fling your French at me, man, snapped Hobart. Speak English. Mr. Blood's smile annoyed him. I am a physician, practicing my calling in the town of Bridgewater. The captain sneered. Which you reach by way of the... Lime Regis, in the following of your bastard duke. It was Mr. Blood's turn to sneer. If your wit were as big as your voice, my dear, it's a great ma it's the great man you'd be by this. For a moment the dragoon was speechless. The color deepened in his face. You may find me great enough to hang you. Faith, yes, ye've the look and the manner of a hangman. But if you practice your trade on my patient here, you may be putting a rope around your own neck. He's not the kind you may string up and no questions asked. He has the right to a trial, and the right to trial by his peers. By his peers? The captain was taken aback by these three words, which Mr. Blood had stressed. Sure now, any but a fool or savage could have asked his name before ordering him to the gallows. The gentleman is my Lord Gildoy. And then his lordship spoke for himself in a weak voice. I make no concealment of my association with the Duke of Monmouth. I'll take the consequences, but if you please, I'll take them after trial, by my peers, as the doctor has said. The feeble voice ceased and was followed by a moment's silence. As is common in many blustering men, there was a great deal of timidity deep down in Hobart. The announcement of his lordship's rank had touched the old depths. The servile upstart, he stood in awe of titles. He stood in awe of his colonel. Percy Kirk was not lenient with blunderers. By a gesture, he checked his men. He must consider. Mr. Blood, observing his pause, added further matter for his consideration. You'll be remembering, Captain, that Lord Gildoy will have friends and relatives on the Tory side who have something to say to Colonel Kirk if his lordship should be handled like a common felon. You'll go warily, Captain, or, as I've said, it's a halter for your neck you'll be weaving this morning. Captain Hobart swept the warning aside with a bluster of contempt, but he acted upon it nonetheless. Take up the daybed, said he, and convey him on that to Bridgewater. Lodge him in the gold till I, until I take order about him. He may not survive the journey, Blood remonstrated. He's in no case to be moved. So much the worse for him. 
my affair is to round up rebels. He confirmed his order by gesture. Two of the men took up the day bed and swung to depart with it. Gildoy made a feeble effort to put a hand forth towards Mr. Blood. Sir, said he, you leave me in your de debt. If I live, I shall study how to discharge it. Mr. Blood bowed for an answer. Then to the men, bear him steadily, he commanded. His life depends on it. As his lordship was carried out, the captain became brisk. He turned upon the yeoman. What other cursed rebels do you harbor? None other, sir. His lordship. We've dealt with his lordship for the present. We'll deal with you in a moment when we've searched your house. And, by God, if you've lied to me. He broke off, snarling to give an order. Four of his dragoons went out. In a moment, they were heard moving noisily in the ad adjacent room. Meanwhile, the captain was questing about the hall, sounding the wainscoting with the butt of a pistol. Mr. Blood saw no profit in himself in lingering. By your leave, it's a very good day. I'll be wishing you, said he. By my leave, you'll remain a while, the captain ordered him. Mr. Blood shrugged and sat down. You're tiresome, he said. I wonder your colonel hasn't discovered it yet. But the captain did not heed him. He was stooping to pick up a soiled and dusty hat in which there was pinned a little bunch of oak leaves. It had been lying near the cloth press in which the unfortunate Pitt had taken refuge. The captain smiled malevolently. His eyes raked the room, resting first sardonically on the omen, then on the two women in the background, and finally on Mr. Blood, who sat with one leg thrown over the other in an attitude of indifference that was far from reflecting his mind. Then the captain stepped to the press, pulled open one of the wings of its massive oaken door. He took the huddled inmate by the collar of his doublet and lugged him out into the open. And who the devil is this? quoth he. Another nobleman? Mr. Blood had a vision of those gallows of which Captain Hobart had spoken, and of this unfortunate young shipmaster going to adorn one of them, strung up without trial, in the place of the other, of, of the other victim of whom the captain had been cheated. On the spot, he invented not only a title, but a whole family for the young rebel. Faith, you've said it, Captain. This is Viscount Pitt, first cousin of Sir Thomas Vernon, who's married to that slut Maul Kirk, sister to your own colonel, and sometimes lady-in-waiting upon King James's queen. Both the captain and his prisoner gasped, but whereas thereafter young Pitt discreetly held his peace, the captain rapped out a nasty oath. He considered his prisoner again. He's lying, is he not? He demanded, seizing the lad by the shoulder and glaring into his face. He's ra he's rallying Rue, by God. If you believe that, said Blood, hang him, and we'll see what happens to you. The dragoon glared at the doctor, and then at his prisoner. Fah! He thrust the lad into the hands of his men. Fetch him along to the bridgewater, and make fast that fellow also, he pointed to Baines. We'll show him what it means to harbor and comfort rebels. There was a moment of confusion. Bain struggled in the grip of the troop troopers, protesting vehemently. The terrified women screamed until silenced by a greater terror. The captain strode across to them. He took the girl by the shoulders. She was a pretty, gold-headed creature with soft blue eyes that looked up entreatingly, piteously into the face of the dragoon. He leered upon her, his eyes aglow, took her chin in his hands, and set her shuddering by his brutal kiss. It's an earnest! He said, smiling grimly, let that quiet you little rebel till I've done with these rogues. And he swung away again, leaving her faint and trembling in the arms of her anguished mother. His men stood grinning, awaiting orders, the two prisoners now fast pinioned. Take them away. Let Cornet Drake have charge of them. His smoldering eye again sought the cowering girl. I'll stay a while to search out this place. There may be other rebels hidden here. As an afterthought, he added, and take this fellow with you. He pointed to Mr. Blood. Bestir! Mr. Blood stared out of his musings. He had been considering that in his case of instruments, there was a lancet, which he might perform on Captain Hobart, a beneficial operation. Beneficial, that is, to humanity. In any case, the dragoon was obviously phthoric, and would be, would be better for a bloodletting. The difficulty lay in making the opportunity. He was beginning to wonder if he could lure the captain aside with some tale of hidden treasure, when this untimely interruption set a term to that interesting speculation. He sought to temporalize. Faith, it will suit me very well, said he, 
for Bridgewater is in my destination. But that ye detain me, I'll have it. I'll have that. That but that ye detained me, I'd have been on my way thither now. Your destination there will be the goal. Ah, bah! You're surely joking. There's a gallows for you if you prefer it. It's merely a question of now or later. Rude hands seized Mr. Blood, and that precious lancet was in the case on the table out of reach. He twisted out of the grasp of the dragoons, for he was strong and agile, but they closed him again immediately and bore him down, pinning him to the ground. They tied his wrists behind his back, then roughly pulled him to his feet again. Take him away, said Hobart short shortly, and turned to issue his order to the other awaiting troopers. Go search the house, from attic to cellar, then report to me here. The soldiers trailed out by the door leading to the interior. Mr. Blood was thrust by his guard into the courtyard, where Pitt and Baines already waited. From the threshold of the hall, he looked back at Captain Hobart, and his sapphire eyes were blazing. On his lips trembled a threat of what he would do to Hobart if he should happen to survive this business. Betimes, he remembered that to utter it were probably to extinguish his chance of living to execute it. For today, the king's men were masters in the West, and the West was regarded as enemy country to be subjected to the worst horror of war by the victorious side. Here, a captain of horse was for a moment lord of life and death. Under the apple trees in the orchard, Mr. Blood and his companions in misfortune were made fast each to a trooper's stirrup leather. Then, at the sharp order of the cornet, the little troop started for Bridgewater. As they set out, there was the fullest confirmation of Mr. Blood's hideous assumption to the dragoons this was a conquered enemy country. There were sounds of rending timbers, of furniture smashing, and overthrown, the shouts of laughter of brutal men, to announce that this hunt for rebels was no more than a pretext for pillage and destruction. Finally, above all other sounds, came the piercing screams of a woman in acutest agony. Baines checked his stride and swung round writhing, his face ashen. As a consequence, he was jerked from his feet by the rope that attached him to the stirrup leather, and he was dragged helplessly a yard or two before the troopers reined in, cursing him foully and striking him with a flat of his sword. It came to Mr. Blood, as he trudged forward under the laden apple tree on that fragrant, delicious July morning, that man, as he long suspected, was the vilest work of God and that only a fool would set himself up as a healer of a species that was best exterminated. End of chapter 2